Last chapter of 2 Corinthians. Aren't you so excited? Please stand with me if you're excited that we are finally going to come to the very end of this long, interesting uh, book full of conflict and passion and drama and, uh, and Jesus-y correction going throughout this, this book. We're going to read chapter 13 and then walk through it and hopefully land it today. Um, there are 13 verses, so it is a bit, we're going to do the whole thing today, and then we'll land it. And uh, yeah, so let's, let's read the text, and then we'll get into it today. Uh, join with me, or listen this morning. I'm going to read from the NET translation. This is the third time, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. This is the third time I'm coming to visit you. By the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter will be established. Verse 2, I said before... When I was present the second time, and now, though absent, I say again to those who sinned previously and to all the rest, that if I come again, I will not spare anyone. Verse 3, since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me, he is not weak towards you, but is powerful among you. For indeed, he was crucified by the reason of weakness, but he lives because of God's power. For we also are weak in him, but we will live together with him because, again, of God's power toward you. Put yourselves to the test. See if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize regarding yourselves that Christ Jesus is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? And I hope that you will realize that we have not failed the test. And now we pray to God that you may not do anything wrong, not so that we may appear to have passed the test, but so that you may do what is right, even if we may appear to have failed the test. Verse 8, for we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the sake of the truth. For we rejoice whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And we pray this, that you may become fully qualified. Because of this, I'm writing these things while absent, so that when I arrive, I may not have to deal harshly with you by using my authority. The Lord gave it to me for building up, not for tearing down. And then this other section kind of stands alone as he wraps it up. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, set things right, be encouraged, agree with one another, live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray. Lord, as we come to the end of this long exegetical teaching through 2 Corinthians on and off again over the last bit, I pray that you would do, Holy Spirit, what only you can do by illuminating this text for us as individuals, as a community, and in light of the larger church and what we can learn from these ancient churches and these letters written on certain occasions. So, Lord, I know that at the end of the day, my ability to change one's heart is limited, but your ability to touch our hearts is unlimited, for you are 100% for your people. So, Lord, we yield this time to you. Help us to be attentive and listen to this wisdom from your word in Jesus' name. And if you're willing to say amen, amen, Amen. please be seated in the presence of the Lord. Well, we're finally there, friends. Made it to the end of 2 Corinthians, and we're going to start topical series next week. But um, let's look at an outline quick of what's going on through this passage, which I'm titling, The Wounded Healers, Testing and Blessing. So here we have this outline that we'll just walk through in just a minute. The third visit, we're told, is this accountability. Uh, He's saying, I am coming and to bring full accountability to this church at my third time in these verses. And it breaks out the testimony of the third visit, verse 1, a warning that Christ will deal with them powerfully, the authentication of faith, um, test yourselves before you wreck yourselves, and then edification, the purpose of Paul's letter. He reminds them again of the whole point of this whole thing. And then finally, he gives them the sending words, the benediction, the blessing, a final list, sort of summarizing a lot of what's been going on in this letter. And I, as I'm reading through this passage and going through 2 Corinthians, it's one of these very 
uh, interesting books in terms of how the language shifts. You know, in the first big song, uh, section of it, he is talking about um, encouraging them and finding ways of affirmation. And then there's a marked shift in the last few chapters that we've been going through where he goes on what is called the fool's speech, to remind you. And the fool's speech has some of the most soaring, crazy uh, rhetoric. Some of it's sardonic. Some of it is, uh, like, he's definitely playing with it. Uh, and, and one of the most famous verses, one that I love in particular, this idea about Christ's strength being made perfect in weaknesses and also that his strength is sufficient for us. Um, powerful stuff in that fool's speech. And then finally, we're moving out of that and we're landing this letter. We're landing the plane. Indeed, we are landing the plane. Paul is landing the plane in chapter 13. So let's walk through this again. Uh, the first few verses here, uh, verses 1 and 2. So he tells us again, this is the third time. And he uses this language from Deuteronomy, by the way, uh, Deuteronomy 19, about what, how many witnesses do you need to verify a testimony against someone in the assembly of Israel or, by extension, the local church. And Paul is saying here, he's using the language that just because someone makes an accusation doesn't mean we take it at face value. He, he says, again, trust but verify by two or three witnesses or testimony. Now, there's a couple different ways that we can understand what's going on in verses 1 and 2 in terms of the witnesses and the testimony. Uh, one way of understanding it is that Paul is saying his previous letters and his previous visits stand as testimony for and against the behaviors and the attitudes of the Corinthians, that he is produ producing this testimony in his repeated visits along with Titus and others that he has sent to verify. So in AD 50, Paul founded the church at Corinth with 18 months of ministry as this initial apostolic church planter. In AD 54, in the spring, we're told of his second visit, the sorrowful visit, uh, due to Timothy's report, Timothy having been in the church at Corinth uh, when Paul was not there. And now he's writing around AD 54 in the winter or the fall, or in AD 55, kind of that winter season there, he's writing this letter for this third visitor. He's saying that the third visit will be coming. And so his letters and trips could be testimony against the false leaders. Uh, again, Deuteronomy 15, 19, 15 says this, You shall do to the false witness what the false witness meant to do to the accused, so you shall purge the evil from your midst. He's sort of creatively uh, grabbing back from Hebrew Bible and letting them know, hey, there is, there is a purpose here in, in me coming to deal with stuff if you're not going to deal with it. Um, and that's interesting when you talk about church structure, right? Like, this is one of the challenges we have in believers' church traditions, Baptists, Pentecostals, Mennonites, a lot of us, we have churches that don't necessarily have that layer above that if a pastor or elders or a church goes off the rails, sometimes the church festers and festers and festers. But Paul, even though he doesn't necessarily, he doesn't have a, a structural authority, he has sort of the authority of the spirit and of being the founding uh, apostle of this church to come in and say, hey, you need to correct your ways here. You need to check yourselves here before you go off the rails. And so he's doing that uh, in that role. And that's something instructive that we might want to learn about uh, organizations and church uh, leadership as well. So Paul may also be saying that indeed there is enough witnesses in the church, the traditional way of using witnesses, that there may be two or three people and many that have turned back towards the truth, but some have not. And so he's saying if the rest of you don't write your ship, there's enough witnesses here to corroborate that there's been bad behavior that needs to be confronted. And I, when I come back, if you have not dealt with it, we're going to deal with this destructive behavior in the church. This also brings up this concept of church discipline. Um, churches need to have systems in place for peacemaking. And some churches I've been in, literally in the bylaws, they've woven in this idea of a peacemaking uh, approach, a restorative approach to dealing with extreme behaviors. And note, he's named covenant-breaking behaviors, both in terms of the use of the body and sexuality, and also in the use of the tongue. And to be sure, most of our churches probably have less of this going on with use of the body and a whole lot more of those damning sins of the tongue. And those are the things that he's saying, these things destroy the local church and must be confronted. And so we talked about this in the past in our church, the difference between peace faking and peace breaking. There's another way of peacemaking which names the stuff, but in a restorative way. And ideally, we're having conversations. We're following Matthew 18, Mark, Matthew 16, uh, the Sermon on the Mount as well, Matthew 5 and 6, on how we do confrontation in a godly way and we steward it for goodness. Uh, when we don't do it, though, we let things fester that can create 
long, long, long uh, sort of trajectory of brokenness in a church. And we can speak of examples we've heard sometimes in other congregations where certain behaviors were just tolerated for years and years and years, whether it's gossiping, backbiting, undermining, and it just destroys and destroys and destroys. Paul would say, no, absolutely not. That must be dealt with. And ideally, we create a culture where we can deal with that. Another thing I want to say about this in verse 1 and 2, he's dealing with the words sins of the mouth and sins of the body in a lot of 2 Corinthians. Um, Gossip is another one. He names gossip and malicious speech again and again and again. Why is it? Because it's something we so easily slip into, right? And I've learned over the years that there's basically two kinds of sources of gossip in a church. Two sources, and one of them is very uncomfortable, and the other one is very uncomfortable. Two sources of gossip in the church. (laughs) I think the first source of gossip is when, when we in leadership try to hold information too tightly. When leadership creates an information vacuum in a church, people want to fill out that information. And so they will gossip to try to figure out, well, why is, what's the story behind the story kind of thing. In that case, the sin tends to be on leadership. People need whether it's pastors, leaders, boards, whatever, um, that need to be way more transparent. Sunshine uh, purifies, Right. The other kind of gossip is just malicious gossip of our own hearts being turned towards tearing someone down. Malicious words in anyone's mind and heart that that we need to submit before Jesus that are really just destructive towards others because we have stuff in our hearts that need to be dealt with. Churches tend to be rife with both of those, uh, especially in different seasons of change. So we need to be careful about those two sources, general sources of gossip in the church. Uh, And Paul would say we need to make sure that we're We are aware that we're bringing things to Jesus in our hearts and that we are also being authentic and open before one another. Okay. And again, there are times to protect information, by the way, if we're trying to help restore someone. That's a totally different situation. Not everyone needs to know everyone else's business, especially if they're working through issues of sin and and, um, maybe trauma or whatever. There is a time for that as well, but most things don't fall into that category. So anyway, Paul's dealing with that in their church. So let's look at the rest of them here. Um, Oh, by the way, Paul earlier in 1 Corinthians talked about some of these sins saying, uh, so what do we do? What is discipline? What is the worst case scenario? Well, in one case, he says, uh, turn someone out of the church. Dismember them. I mean, like remove them from members, not literally dismember them, but remove them. (laughs) That sounded bad. Remove them from membership, separated from the body. I guess spiritually, that is a sort of dismembering until they repent and change uh, how they're going about it. Uh, Or he says, turn such a one over to Satan that Satan may destroy them in terms of the sins of the body in 1 Corinthians 5.13. But those are the extremes. Hopefully you never get to that point because we're doing the consistent engagement in confronting stuff that's destructive in ourselves before God and others and finding ways to move more and more in that way. We do not operate like the kingdom of the world when it comes to conflict and certain destructive patterns. We need to be the people that engage with that. Okay, that was a whole sermon in and of itself. Amen? All right. Uh, Verses 3 through 4, he begins to, again, go back through some of the stuff that's happened earlier about their demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. And he talks again, he goes back and forth with this weakness and strength metaphor. So Christ is weak and that he is crucified on the cross, this sign of ultimate shame, dying a criminal's death on the cross. And that in that, because he was sinless, uh, the father, and, and because it is the plan of God, <laughs> the father raises him from the dead and vindicates him through the power of the resurrection. So you have the weakness of the cross and the power of the resurrection totally against human models of power as showing that this is the true, uh, the true uh, again, deeper and older magic. This is the true power of God on display. And Paul is saying in his ministry, Paul in some ways has mirrored how Christ in these verses, how Christ has worked in this and saying that he has been willing to let himself be in the one down position to be weakened, to be shown as a fool in order that they might be driven closer to the power of God in Christ and experience this different kind of power, different than what they have brought from their cultures into the local church. And so he is unpacking this in these verses. Um, One commentator puts it this way, the theological foundation of Paul's warning unfolding throughout chapters 10 through 13 is crystallized in verses 3 and 4 in chapter 13. When he arrives, Paul will not spare the Corinthians since they are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through him. Believing that Christ was not weak but powerful among them, the Corinthians insisted that Christ's apostles must manifest such power as well. And so Paul's saying, no, in fact, the power I'm manifesting is the power of the cross, and that is different than what they think leadership should look like. 
Um, and Paul is also letting them, Ben Witherington says this, if there is still need for proof that he's authorized and empowered as an agent of Christ, Jesus will be strong in their midst through weak Paul. N.T. Wright says this about these passages, and again, these verses in the middle here, 3, 5 through 6, are pretty, um, pretty there's a lot of um, layers in this, but N.T. Wright uh, puts it this way as well. The Messiah was crucified in weakness, so Jesus was crucified in weakness, but he lives by God's power, and that is the basis for everything he does. And that's why he can say that his own strange blend of radical weakness, Paul's strange blend of radical weakness and spiritual power are a sure sign that the Messiah Jesus is at work in what Paul is doing and, and living into and speaking through him. N.T. Wright says this, pastors, we might add leaders, still find it difficult to maintain the balance between tyrannical rule or never dare to warn people about the consequences of wicked behavior, never exercising discipline at all. Tyrannical rule, never exercising discipline at all. Now, if you've been in a church land for very long and you've been around any older Christians, you have heard stories of churches with tyrannical rule, abusive uses of power. In our day and age, and sometimes we've gone too far the other direction, I would say, in that instead of finding that third way, weakness and power, gently restore, as Paul says in Galatians to the church, we've gone the other way of we're not even involved in any, like we, we call nothing out on ourselves. People can, uh, you know, tear down the whole enterprise in one day and sitting with their tongue, and we never call that nonsense out. Um, on the other hand, and so yeah, we have to be careful of this, that tyrannical rule, yeah, we don't want that. Uh, make someone stand in front of a church in a public gathering on a Sunday morning and shame them to death. We don't want to do that. On the other hand, we don't want to pretend that, hey, everyone here is a saint and you all floated in this morning and we all float in every time, all the time. Well, we know that's not true. We are in process till the kingdom come and the full redemption of our hearts, minds, and bodies when the king comes towards the end and the renewal of all things. So we live into that. And so it goes on, off and on and he says this, often it's only the wounded, by the way, that who can heal. He says, often it's only those who themselves have received the sentence of death who can sit as judges. And this is important when we talk about church restoration and dealing with issues that are going off the rails in any local church. It is better to have those who have received mercy work with people that need mercy than with those who have acted as if they didn't need mercy because then they will be tempered in how they approach this. Judith Deal says this about verse 4, a biblical scholar. She says, the essence of Paul's thought is this. In the same way that Christ appeared weak on the cross, yet was vindicated by God, so too Paul, this apostle, may appear weak on account of his sufferings and hardships. Remember verse, uh, chapters 10, 11, 12. Yet he will be fully vindicated by God's power when he returns and sets matters right in Corinth, if there's still matters that need to be set right by the time he returns. Ken Sandy says this about this idea of church discipline. He says, unfortunately, most churches don't employ any formal discipline until offenses are so terrible, relationships are so shattered, and patterns so ingrained that the chances of restoring anyone are very small. One commentator goes on and says about this, about Ken Sandy, he says this, what Sandy is driving at in his peacemaking ministry is the reality that many churches have an unbiblically high tolerance for obvious sin. And such a tolerance breeds ineffective church discipline, too little, too late. For church discipline to be effective, leaders must be willing to address uh, biblical uh, offenses and fractions earlier in the process, thereby increasing the odds of getting a believer back on track. And I would add, myself, in a Jesus-centered way, never in a harsh authoritarianism, but in a Jesus-centered Mark Baker, here's how we deal with sins in the local church way. As Baptists, our temptation will either be to do nothing or go back into the very harsh judgmentalism. We're not talking about that, but there's another way. Now, no, Paul has been dealing with this in Corinth now for three letters, three visits, letters that we don't even have. In 1 Corinthians, he is dealing with a church that has all kinds of stuff, charismatic gifts being misused, the body being misused, the tongue, people just tearing each other down with their tongue, social economic divisions, like every possible big sin issue is there in 1 Corinthians. And he's been taking time again and again and again. So by the time we get to this third visit and, and, and saying, okay, 
uh, I'll have to come with the power of Christ if, if, they're, if they're still. And most have turned back towards the gospel. Most have pointed their arrows back towards Jesus. Yeah, they're not perfect, but they're working on their stuff. But there's a few false teachers. There's a few people that think they're holier than everybody. There's, there's some of that still going on in the church. And so he's, he's saying, after he spent now what, two years, multiple letters, uh, and trying to bring loving correction, sending envoys. So keep in mind the context of this. By the time we get to the end of this, he has invested the time in this place. And he was the, the founding church planter apostle as well. And so keep in mind, his heart is not just to crack the whip. His heart is that they come more alive in Jesus. That's what's driving him this whole time, even though he's been uh, accused of other uh, motivations. Okay, well, let's go on. Verses 5 and 6, just a little more. He says, put yourselves to the test. Say it with me. Put yourselves to the test. Okay, that was weak. Put yourselves, one more time. Put yourselves to the test. So Paul, who has kind of been on the defensive a little bit here, now flips it and says, hey, oh, by the way, examine yourselves. Check yourself before you wreck yourself, as the song says or whatever. Um, do you not recognize? Basically saying, are you seeing Christ in you or not? Do you pass the test or not? Are you pointing the arrow of your life and your identities towards Jesus? Are you moving in this Christwardly way towards the crucified and risen Christ and his life and teachings? Are you the real deal? Test your authenticity. He puts them back on their heels. He says, not only should you be testing me, you should be testing your own soul. Where is your heart at? Begin the examination of your own heart and motives. What's driving you? What are the things going on? What, what, what do you need to engage with, with, with uh, you know, the, the church, with therapy, with whatever, in order to get that attitude and to get that, your thinking and behavior aligned with something that is life-giving for you and for others that is focused on Jesus? Where are you at theologically, ethically, socially with Jesus? Do you have a living and vital connection to Christ? If you're claiming to follow Christ and lead in the church, as all of us are called to be ministers if we follow Christ in some way, shape, or form, where are you at? Test yourself he says. And he says, now if you fail, and you might fail, dissension, sin, rebellion, false teaching, they're rife in the church, some will not pass the test. And his point is not to crush them, his point is to call them to change, to call them to let the Spirit work within them, to do the work that they need to do, to know themselves and be transformed into the best version of who they are in Jesus through his grace, to receive the love of God again, or maybe the first time for some. In verse 6, Paul says he has passed this test and continues to. And so 7 and 8, uh, he says, uh, we pray to God that you may not do anything wrong so that we may not appear to have passed the test, but so that you may do what is right even if we appear to fail. So Paul's saying, if we look weak to you and we fail in your eyes, but we're faithful to Christ and you're moving towards Christ, he'll consider that a victory. Even if he uh, looks a little dirtier from their perspective, he is moving the church and they are moving forward in Christ. And so he says this, verse 8, moving along, verse 8 and 10, for we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the sake of truth. Paul has been captivated by the truth, which is Jesus. And he says, we'll rejoice when we're weak, but you're strong. And we, meaning himself and his team, we pray for this so that you may become fully qualified. But because of this, I'm writing these things while absent so that when I arrive, I may not have to deal harshly with you by using my authority. The Lord gave me the authority for building up and not tearing down. So Paul's saying when he comes there, and the interesting thing is apparently when he was there and the church was planted, not a great speaker, ugly guy, uh, and generally they didn't like that he was choosing to, to uh, fund himself outside and not participate in the Roman patronage system. So he had these three marks against him. But when that church was founded, when some of them began to believe in Jesus, there were signs and wonders and works of the Holy Spirit. The charismatic gifts were on display in Paul. And he says this, that your, that your wisdom, that your faith may rest on God and on his power, not on the eloquence of human words or wisdom. And so he's saying there is an authority there of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he says, I don't want to have to use that anointing in a way to do church discipline when I come. You guys handle that before I get there. So when I get there, I can simply pour into you and love on you and care for you, Corinthians. But oh, by the way, if you don't do it, I'll still have to do the other thing because I'm not a negligent parent. I will deal with it. I won't let my child put their hand on the hot stove uh, if I'm standing right there. I won't let them run out into the street if I'm right there to grab them. I will indeed bring correction to the church. He wants him to repent so he doesn't have to display power to do spiritual discipline, but power just simply to build up, to love, to encourage, and get them sent out on mission again. Hallelujah. 
That's every pastor's dream. You never want to do the other stuff. But indeed, sometimes, sometimes. So he would rather that they do it right, right, even if it means in their eyes he appears to be a failure. Yeah, we got this fixed without you, Paul. And he's, he's like, I will celebrate, I will dance, and I will sing if you get that fixed without me. Praise the Lord. <laughs> if I appear to be a failure, great. That means I actually am successful in the ministry according to Christ. Verse 10, he wants to build them up. And now we get to the final verses. And we better pause and just take a breath and say, hallelujah, amen. <laughs> here he gets to the closing. The last few verses here, 11 through 14. One scholar says this, Unlike other ancient letters, in which the closings were curt and only linked to the body of the letter in a general way, Paul expands the letter closing significantly, strategically employing it to echo specific themes throughout the earlier part of the letter. And Paul's closings aren't merely ways to end his letters, they're summations of his arguments, as Wimma puts it, Every one of Paul's letter closings relates in some way or other to the key issues taken up throughout the body of the letter. And the closings serve as a hermeneutical spotlight, an interpretive spotlight, highlighting the central concerns of the apostle in his letters and illuminating our understanding of the themes and issues. And so Paul closes the letter with some additional commands in verse 11, greetings in verse 12, and two farewell blessings or benedictions, one for peace and one for grace in each closing highlighting a main theme of his letter. Now, I want to say this about the closing of 2 Corinthians 2. In some letters, like uh, Philippians, Paul has all kinds of glowing, wonderful... So in case you think Paul's like, is he always this dark and harsh? No. In Philippians, he's like, man, I love you guys. Joy just comes to my heart whenever I think of you. Sunshine and, and rainbows and flowers and you know, all this. Corinthians and Galatians, not so much. <laughs> in fact, Galatians, he presses hard until the final blessing. And in fact, in Galatians... Similar to 2 Corinthians, he does not begin with a thanksgiving about all the things he's thankful for with them. He's like, oh my goodness, you guys have basically killed me. I've died a thousand deaths. I'm, I'm experiencing the cross life because of you. Not sure that's what Jesus wanted, but here we are. Um, and so he has that sort of like, oh my goodness. Uh, and there's a lot of comparisons between Galatians and 2 Corinthians. Hard letters for hard church situations. And the open and the close of the letters indicate this. Finally, verse 11. Oh, I got to land this. Brothers and sisters, rejoice, set things right, be encouraged, agree with one another, live in the peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Paul is giving them commands, rejoice. Hear these words here. That's about your mouth. That's what's coming out of your mouth. That's how you're speaking. That's, are you a people of praise and thanksgiving and gratitude and joy? Can you name the goodness of wonder of original created beauty and love? There's a place for that. Set things right. Deal with broken relationships. Be encouraged. Agree with one another. Stop tearing each other down. Uh, build each other up. Live in peace. And the love of God and peace will be with you. You lean into this and the power and the anointing of God is released of love and peace within you. Paul reminds them that in Christ, they are brothers as well. Now, finally, brothers and sisters, we are family. This is a church that is a diverse church and he's calling them to a new familial sense of understanding who they are. They are being created as a people they are called to be a people, but they must choose to enter into that and make those choices over and over. At the beginning, he indicates this again, that he's addressing the repentant as well, those that have mostly already turned, and he's encouraging them to continue on in that turning journey. Verse 12, greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh, so greeting team, we have some new instructions for you. <laughs> that was, some of you will get that later. Okay. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you in the love of God. Uh, by the way, what's going on with the holy kiss here? Um, this is culturally something more similar. We may say a good handshake or maybe a hug or something like that in our culture. But this idea of greeting one another warmly. The kiss, one scholar says, should be seen in a living context of people who are building a new sociological reality, a new family, rather than in restrictive uh, like church worship terms. Paul was the first popular ethical teacher to instruct members of mixed social groups to greet each other with a holy kiss when they met. So in fact, it was subversive. It was inclusive beyond what would have even been the normal practice with who you would greet with a kiss. And so this kiss is more about this idea of in actions that are including people in the body. So Paul's calling them again to welcome one another with the love of God. 
By the way, this phrase, the love of God, that particular phrase is only said this way throughout all of New Testament. Uh, the phrase, quote, the love of God. Be family, be like family, and engage and include and expand and welcome one another as family members. In the very end of this verse, he says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And this is what we might call a proto-Trinitarian statement in the New Testament. It is true that the word Trinity does not appear in the New Testament, but those that would be considered non-Orthodox will, may reject the idea of the Trinity, but the Trinity is woven all over the place. Even though the word isn't used, the concept is all over. And here we have that same concept here of God being revealed as the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, meaning the God, the creator, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And so there's the beginning of the Trinitarian theology. And as he spent this whole letter telling them, be a family, be in relationship, do the things that build up, get away from sins that destroy other people's covenant boundaries and that uh, rip down one another, he's ending the very thing by saying, oh, by the way, all of this reflects the creator. The whole point of creation is a God who exists as relationship and creates us to be in relationship out of overflowing love and abundance and joy. So they too should be like the Godhead working together and they will be blessed greatly if they follow this pattern of the Trinity. And thus he ends the letter. Amen and amen. I'm going to invite the worship team, well, the worship duo to come up this morning. And um, we're going to prepare as we end this letter to receive communion. But I want to remind you of the final sort of summary of some of the major points here in this last chapter. Paul has been deeply wounded in his life and his ministry and there's something about ministering to others in their times of challenge through your own woundedness. That there's a time for healing, boundaries that are about healing, but often those that help others heal are those that speak out of their own woundedness instead of out of our strength. We speak out of our cross experiences versus our areas of false strength oftentimes. We see that weakness and power work together in Jesus, and this is an indication of a healthy church, that we hold these together. And I want to say in this last chapter, the language of self-check is big. Test yourselves. Maybe there's things in your life that you need to test yourself. If you want to help someone and make the church a healing place, you have to be in a place where you're diagnosing yourself and you're wrestling with your own sins because you are, as Luther said, a saint and sinner in process at the same time all of your life until the life to come. Hopefully we're growing in Christ's likeness and sanctification, but we still have things in our lives that God hasn't even revealed to us yet because we can't handle it at this stage. And so that humility guides us in that. And finally, the blessed church, a church that works together in, well, rejoicing, in making things right, in being encouraged and encouraging one another and agreeing with one another and living in peace. And remember, not peace faking and not peace breaking, but peace making. And this is the, where the love of God and peace will be with us as a community. And that nothing in this world can take away. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus.